as everything starts coming on, I like to say welcome to Bridges Live. I'm Dr. Paul. And I have a great special guest that's coming on with me, Mr. Dell Weston. And um, just Dell will talk to you more about him than about anything. But I, you know, when we get into what Dell's going to talk about, you have a great opportunity to reach out to him to say, I was thinking about that and I did not know who to contact to now get involved. Dell, please introduce yourself and tell people what you're doing. Hey, hey, hey. Hi, everybody. My name is Dell Weston. Uh, I am a recovering creative. <laughs> and I got my, my, my uh, third year chip yesterday, so I'm feeling pretty good. I write, produce, direct, and uh, I also run a pretty big film festival. And I produce a magazine called the Action, Action on Film Awa Megafest Magazine. Our biggest edition is coming out this December. It's our all action, action star edition. And I also do a lot of uh, charity work, uh, yeah. depending on the project. I've been doing it for about 30 years. Uh, I also do a mentorship program for young uh, writers and producers and directors. You know, um, we... And Jesus loves me. It is. Jesus does love you. <laughs> Jesus loves me. That's right. But let's get that out. I should have said that first. <laughs> You, you, when it talks about action on film, you know, I have done Dell's show and, and did seminars out there, and I just love the writers and directors who have these great, amazing questions about how action is, because I do the martial arts stuff, I do all the movement stuff, but Dell puts on the writing clinic, the, the script, the, not just the writing, but the type of scripts. The type of directing you have, you just have an amazing group of people that come out there that support your action on film festival. That is beyond words. It, 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 it to me, it's my Grammys. When you know, when people talk about the Grammys awards, it, it is up there. And you've been doing it for a long time now. Wow, this is our yeah you know, seventeenth year, um, continuous operation. And I'll tell you, even during COVID. The, the state shut down events that were as large as ours, but we still partnered with the Galaxy Theaters and we showed films uh, during the month of the festival month at the theaters. Wow. And so seating was limited, but, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to maintain some type of uh, desire to continue whatever it is you're doing. And I just don't stop. I'm a little trained that maybe could. I don't know. I'll give it a shot. You know, when we talk about mentoring, one of the things I think, how, what is that desire? You know, a lot of people are, are feeling very anxious. I talk, I do my, I do my show, Mental Health Mondays, and things like that. Talk about how to get people to be okay with being not okay. But what are some of those things that you help people with when they're not feeling not so great, and yet they can? You keep pushing on, but you don't push on through misery. You push on through. No, you push no. on with joy. No, they told me I. They told me I had COVID. I threw a party and like ninety people showed up. I was like, wait a minute, I think it's a bad thing, isn't it? <laughs> and then everybody drank their drinks, and ate their food, and left. It was, I mean, I'm not making light of COVID because we know it's a very serious um, infection, but we also know that um, so is breathing, and right. so is driving a car, and so is having cancer, and so is having heart disease, and so mm -hmm. is being old, I mean, everybody's like they're going to live forever for some reason. And I got news for you, you're not. So you got to, you got to pump up the volume immediately and continuously and without ceasing because the thing that's between you and your goal mm. is usually only one thing. You. And that's you. Yeah. I, I find people to be amazingly powerful and incredible and brilliant but a lot of them are fear-based. A lot of them don't have faith in their lives. And so with no faith in their life, their, their ships are rudderless. And I'm here to tell you, like much like Prince did in Purple Rain, <laughs> it's an amazing experience, but you have, to, you have to live. And I think what I've been able to do for people more than, than not is inspire them to, to create, produce, and to follow their dreams. I, I... Because without that, you have nothing. I, I, I was um, going through a therapy session today. My therapy session, right? Yeah. People say, we all have 
sessions, I, I, I give sessions, and I have a session, right? Why not? And he had asked me, he goes, what is the one thing, you, after all the things you've been through and the things you do, what is it, what is it, what pulls it all together? I said, I choose to live. Mm-hmm. Everything else under that is work. Everything else under that is what you're going to do. But once you once you have a choice, once you choose to live, the rest is now what do you what are you gonna do with that choice, right? And and I think that's so difficult for people to see that because no matter what miraculous story you've ever heard, they've only said one thing. I'm gonna live. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to, this plane wreck, whatever, this mountain, this avalanche, this shark bite, no matter what the story is, they said the one thing, I'm going to live. You know, I'll tell you, if, I, if anyone ever said that I was successful, to myself, I don't see myself as successful. I see myself in process. And yeah. whenever someone says, oh, you succeeded, I succeeded with what? Yeah. If I'm talking to a person like you, I must have failed miserably. <laughs> then they like come back away real slow. You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, no. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very simple thing. And everyone has choices. And if you have a choice, it means you have power. So if everyone has right. a choice, and a choice equals power, right. then everyone has power. Then you have power, and you have a direction. There's no reason you can't get where you want to go. It's, it's when you fail to recognize the strength that you have inside to accomplish anything you set your mind to now thank goodness i don't want to be an evil genius because i'm short on the evil and genius parts but <laughs> i guess i can try you know but that's not my thing my thing is something else and, and for what i'm trying to be and for what i want to do i have all the talents and skills and gifts that i need but those gifts mean nothing if you won't put your get up out of the bed put your feet down flat jump up and get started you know, that, that's, and I, I feel so bad. You know, I had a young brother in here uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was trying to mentor and help and blah, blah, blah. I never heard so many excuses in my life. Never. I was just, I was shocked. What was, what was, what was the one excuse that you remember that, out of so many? What was the one that just, that you remember so vividly? Uh, a kid told me they didn't think they were worth it. They didn't think they were worth being helped. They didn't know that they were worth someone giving them the attention that they that they might could deserve, right? And I said might could on purpose, right? Because they took away the chance by saying, "Well, it might I might deserve it." And then they took it into the lexicon of "I could deserve it." So it was a possibility. So one, the might cause was that someone chooses to help, but the could was more identifying as a self awareness and what that power from being self aware is. And they had knocked themselves down on both fronts. And I said, that's a tough call. Because when someone has been raised in a way where they have zero self-worth yeah. or zero self-esteem, it's very difficult to show them exactly how great they could be. Because first you've got to have a building block and express to them, well, do you have arms? Yes. Do you have legs? Right, right. Yes. Do you have a brain? Yes. Do you have a back? Yes. So you've got all these elements that equal something that could be powerful. You just have to tie them together. But some people have been so destroyed. I think that's what the world is very good at. It, mm. It's brilliant at taking beauty and innocence and strength and turning them into fear and dependency and to illness. And I think that is such a terrible thing because we do it to each other nonstop. Because until you become self-actualized and recognize that, yes, I'm bleeding, but I cut myself. You didn't cut me. Then you were a victim. Now, the moment you say, yeah, and because I introduced myself to you and loved you or tested you or played with you, I got cut. Well, you made the decision to engage that person to begin with. So if you can slow yourself down long enough to recognize that whatever happens to you is because of you, right? So once you get past the victim ideology, and by the way, we're all victims. I don't care if you were born a king or a prince or whatever. Everyone has challenges. Some people have advantages, but everyone has challenges. So whether someone started out, you know, 50 feet ahead of you or five miles ahead of you, you're still in the race. Nothing changes that. You're still in the race. And you have to run that motor hard, man. Put it down to the middle and go. See where you end up. 
So, you know, like, being in film, I'm going to bring this back to film real quick. Now, do you think some films hurt or help the victimology? Oh, films absolutely support the victimology. Okay. And you got to remember something. Okay, I was a kid that that saw Rocky Five. I, I'll give you, I'll see how it really happened. I'm in the theater, one of the most beautiful theaters in the world. It was in, in a city called Pasadena, California, on Rosemead Boulevard. It's called the Hastings Theater. They had one of the biggest screens in the world at this theater. So I would go see movies there all the time. Then at one point, somebody got smart and we break this gigantic theater up into one really big theater and four small ones, we can make a lot more money. So right, right. when that happened, I already felt slighted because you pay the same money for the small theaters you pay for the big <laughs> screen. I love those big screens, man. So I'm sitting there and a karate kid is on. I see Ralph Macchio. And he's getting bullied and beat up and strained. And I'm like, man, that's my life. You know? And then the girl befriends him for a second. But, you know, she's, there's a better looking guy in the background. You know, she's dating and actually giving a little love to him. You're just getting up to have a soda with but some guy's getting lucky. <laughs> so I'm going, that's my life too. <laughs> I wish I had an electric cat. So I buy some love. So I'm sitting in the theater and I'm eating my popcorn and this scene hits and I just start crying. And I just I cannot uncontrollably cry. And I thought to myself, what is wrong with me? Why do I feel this? And I saw that this guy, Ralph Macchio, could actually take lessons from a house painter <laughs> janitor gardener named Miyagi and he could go out and, and beat down six, seven, eight people I'm like well, hang, hang on a second that's, that tastes good to me and I would have had a burger in a couple of weeks I'm like get me some of that meat right so I went over and got trained by a guy named David German and David German mm-hmm. led the Frank Trail and Frank Trail led the Tom Serrano and Tom Serrano led the James McGrath James you know he goes on down but what occurred was I recognized that in films like that, the franchise truly was violence. The franchise wasn't peace and right, love. Right, right. The franchise was taking your wounded left leg, standing on it in the crane position, then kicking someone in the head with your right foot. That was that was the message. Now, if you go back to another hero film, which I love, the Rocky film, I'm sitting there, I'm in my seat, and, and, and Clubber Lang comes out. And they ask him, what do you predict for your fight with Rocky Balboa? He says, I predict pain. Right? <laughs> Come here, fool. Hey, woman. You want a real man, not that paper tiger. Right? Well, I had been in a situation like that where I met this girl. And some guy came out of nowhere like, what did this guy? He's a, he's a ghost. Look at him. Looks like Casper stand over. You don't want anything to do with that. And little did he know I could walk through walls. That's how I got to him later on that night. But I could walk through walls just like that ghost. And the beauty of it is that even in that film, Violence is the message. Well, violence is not the way. No. It's just not the way. The knowledge of what you could be and using that intelligently with the right amount of power and the right amount of, of focus. Oh, my God. You don't have to go out there and pull a knife and cut somebody in the back. But most of these films we talk about where there's a great hero structure, and I love these movies. I was in Rocky Five. I did a movie with Jet Li. Right, right. So I know, you know, what the workings of it uh, uh, should look like but the point is we don't teach love we teach violence as a way so if you look at all the westerns the magnificent seven shane all these things one of my favorite you know, movies by mine too but it teaches you violence and how to kill your problem there's another way it's it's called your intellect and i'm not saying there's not time for a beat down because there is but wait a minute some- in magnificent seven he gave him an out he says listen Remember he brought he remember he yeah. brought him to the table. He says, "Yeah, you can leave now, or, or, right." And he's like, "I got all these men." He but goes, he "Was dedicated to violence himself." Yeah. He said, "We're going to stay and fight. You can go, but you know we have a we have a mission now. His mission, and that's what we teach little boys, and that's what we teach young men, and that's what we teach men, and that's what we teach the guys coming out of jail. That violence is the key. Well, if you want that, then your life is going to be completely about violence. Right. Right." Violence is only a stepping stone to self-awareness and self-fulfillment if you are weak. If you are strong, the average man gets into, I think it's 3.2 fights in his lifetime now. Right. 3.2 Maybe. fights in his lifetime. I've had over 330. Yeah, I'm way past that. <laughs> yeah. So my thing was, if you're born into it, you have to find a way to get out of it. Just like if you're born stupid, you've got to find a way out of it. Well, how, do you, how do you get out of being stupid? You read a book. 
Then you repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it. Adds nauseam until you find out that your vocabulary is better. Your understanding of critical thinking is better. Mm -hmm. Your understanding of, of uh, the world is better. Human condition is better because you've experienced it through these magnificent words of people who've already experienced it as well. So I think a lot of times we take these movies and the hero films, I think become an excuse for violence. And that, that's again, it. is not that's power. Right. That's right. Violence is just violence. So that's my take on it. I don't know. I don't know. You know, it, it's it's one of those things, and I think when it comes to film, I think people miss the context to it, and yeah. and, and no one's there to explain the film to them, and that and that's not what it's supposed to be. No one's there to explain music context either, but no. definitely film resonates with so many people, and they're and they're missing so much of it. You know, yeah. they don't. If it was just what they thought it was. It wouldn't take years to do. No. No. So, you could draw a picture of someone getting their ass kicked and all of a sudden everything would be all right. Well, I understand. But there, there was a change uh, in film, much like the change that you see uh, in, in written work, or change you see in music. It, it used to be, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not against anybody in particular right. group or people, but I wouldn't let my kids listen to rap music if it was only music that was ever created. I just wouldn't do it. At that young age, you put classical music on because classical music has been proven to help okay. the brain as it develops. That's all I'm, If someone told me it helps you breathe deeper, it helps you sleep, and that's enough. <laughs> but when someone says that it helps the brain develop in younger people more quickly and better and stronger, you know, I had my wife wear a Walkman around her stomach. We take the things to her belly and play classical music. And both my kids are, I think, top 5% of the entire United States in academics. They've had 4.0 uh, yeah. grade averages. All seven years, and my, my daughter and I, yeah, so she's in high school. So every year of her, since high school down, she's had a 4.0, and so is my son. And the reason for that is there was no rap music in their heads, destroying their brain and their ears, and it doesn't develop anything. And that's not, about, that's not against rap. No. It's a beautiful art form if you to enjoy rap. But for the young mind, you don't start out by destroying it. And then the lyrics for these music, the music that's out there, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a music of struggle, it's a music of joy, it's a music of pain. Okay, great, I get all that. But I also didn't raise my kids with a, a blues song going on in their head all night long. You know what I mean? Right. I right. don't have the rent. I can't feed my dog. My wife just left me. My <laughs> brother's sleeping with my son. I don't want to hear all that. I just had a guest on. We were he's he's an audio pharmacology. We were just talking about the metaphysics of music and how it affects the brain, how it affects the body, how it affects the cells, and how it it hurts you for a healing process. We talked about we talked about the vibration and the megahertz to all of that. And people and also the frequencies. Yes. People don't want to talk about the frequencies, but the frequencies can can destroy you. Yes. You know, and, and it's funny. I, I always say this. You know, the Bible, it says my people are lost for a lack of knowledge. And, 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 I, and I don't think that people pay attention enough when you think about that. It's like, well, what is knowledge? Right. It's not the knowledge of yourself. It's not the knowledge of the world. It's not the knowledge of facts. What is knowledge? What is true knowledge? And true knowledge always comes down for me, understanding your purpose. And once you understand your purpose, you can understand how you can move within the ramifications of the power and ability that you have. But if you don't understand your purpose, you're a cannonball shot in any direction. And you can cause damage, or you could be worthless. You know, but it's up but, to you. but 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 then, if you don't understand it, and here's I'll stress this so hard: just ask for help. Just raise. That's your... the other key. That's the other part of it, man. See, people seem somehow to think that their pride takes the place of their needs. Mm. And I've heard for years that you can't eat your pride. But people have such a pride. I remember when I got my first big movie job, I was so hungry. I had no money. I was out of gas in my car. 72 Ford Maverick. I was embarrassed to drive it. <laughs> but I had a hot girlfriend, so it was okay. You know, she would ride in the car, but she was too hot. Anyway, uh, I'm on a movie set uh, at Warner Brothers, and Bobby Bass, the, the stunt coordinator, came over and said, Hey, man, uh, there's a truck over there. There's no food free. Let's go eat. I said, No, thank you. I was starving. I hadn't eaten probably in a day. And I didn't eat the day before because I needed the money for gas for my car to get where I was going. So I had to make that choice. And by the way, you know, it wasn't a you know, big choice to me then. I didn't know I was fasting anyway. But because I didn't ask, I lost opportunity. Right? 
and I began getting big movies, big movies, and I and I and I, and I didn't understand that the, the job was not the role you were playing. Mm. The job was getting the job and being a part of the industry. So when they tapped hard with me in the SAG, I had no respect for SAG because I didn't understand what the card meant. Right, right, right. So I ended up going on the Gong Show. Right <laughs> with um. Ferris, what is his Chuck name? Barris. Chuck no, Ferris. The second iteration where the new host, a tall skinny guy, but I had worked at a comedy club called the Ice House for about a decade, so I knew a lot of people. Well, three of the judges on the panel were all from the Ice House. <laughs> and they recognized me in this one scumbag, piece of garbage, loser, bastard named Bobby Slayton. Hey, Bobby, I love you, bro. <laughs> this bastard says to the thing, I, I happen to know him, so I can't give him a 10, although he deserves it. So they gave me less, which means we didn't win the grand prize. But because I was in SAG, I got twenty five hundred dollars for the for a forty minute show up. And I think that people understand if you did if you weren't in the union, your check would have been one hundred twenty five dollars or two hundred dollars. But by being in SAG, right, that helped that bump paid some bills. So you have to be in the room. You have to be in the game. And and the game is not standing on the corner mm. slinging drugs to destroy your brothers. Right. The game is actually living a life worth living that raises your brothers up as well as yourself. Because you got to remember, we're all vibrations. We're yes. all the music. We're all tonality and frequencies, right? And sometimes your frequency is anger, and sometimes your frequency is love, and sometimes you're... But if you can control those frequencies for any situation you're in, you can control that stance or that knowledge of what you are and how you are in your power. Oh my God! You become something to reckon with, but too many people have been destroyed. The world is destroyed. You, I want to say thank everyone for watching. Please, if you have any questions and you have any, you want to contact Dell. Please, for, we're going to get to that where Dell's going to give out his information. If you want to. Um, contact him, especially about anything. Just talk to him, right? This is the man. It's the most. It's, it's, I love having the people, the friends, and the family I have, and I, I keep reaching out to them, and and they just keep touching me with their love and their passion. I just love it. But you, you know, it's funny you say that because um, uh, doing these podcasts and doing these shows and magazines and interviews, which has really been great for like, I mean, people are really great about having me on shows in the last couple of years. It's actually been quite exciting. My second ex-wife was able to find me. She reached out to me through the, uh, through the internet. And she wrote a simple question. She said, hey, it's me. And, and I just had a question. And I wrote back, yeah, what would you like? What do you want to know? And she said, do you still love me? Wow. And I wrote back, love you. I married you. Right, right. And she wrote back, that proves nothing. I said, which is why we're not married anymore. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> What did Teresa say? <laughs> what? Oh, I don't talk about my wife. <laughs> I don't talk about my current stuff, dude. my kid. Not a, not, you know, like I don't mention names or heights or ages. I, listen. Don't do I'll it. Tell you someone, I'll tell you someone who reached out to me. I, I was shocked because I gave my contact out. I was shocked to get a job off. Someone read, hey man, I saw your stuff. I want to hire you. I said, you got to check. He said, well, how much? And I told him that check was here two days later. I said, wow. I love the internet. And you sound good on it, so that's good. Anyway, go ahead. I digress. You have a film that you're doing now, or is it done? Well, you know, COVID to me was an opportunity. Okay. I know people say, oh, listen, okay. If you get half a brain, I mean, really, if you have a half a brain function, you'll understand that this whole thing is based upon fear. It's about making you afraid. Yeah. Making you scared. There's a lot of fear. Making you uh, impotent in every and all ways. In fact, I, I go to the supermarket here in Vegas. I've been going there for about five years. Every day I walk in, I see the mask. Hey, bro, how you? We talked for a few minutes. A couple months ago, I walked in. I have a mask on. It was over my lip but under my nose because I had a cold. I guess it was more allergies than a cold because it wasn't sick. It was just like I had some milk or something, so my allergies were up. So I didn't want to cover my nose, so I walked in, and the guy was saying, man, you can pull your mask up. And I said, hey, man, you need to pull your mask up. I said, what happened to, hey, bro, how you doing? He goes, oh, it's just serious. I said, serious? is yes. Yeah. I said, why don't you drop out of the market business, go to school to become a doctor and help heal people? Oh, it's not that serious. Just serious enough for you to want to talk to me this way in front of people. I get it. 
So I took my mask all the way out. I said, well, if I wear it like this, I put it on top of my head. He goes, you can't do that. I said, what's going to happen? Is the sky going to crack and everyone's going to fall out? Is it, all the fish in the sea going to jump up on land and we're going to have a giant fish? What's going to happen if I do that? Here's what's going to happen. Nothing. You're going to shut up and I'm going to do my shopping and we go on with life. And I wasn't trying to upset a frontline right. worker. I'm just saying that the tone with the small modicum of power he thought he had, he wanted to use to be nasty and mean and indignant. And that's not good. And I was like, wow, you must be horrible in bed with your wife. And he's like, what? I said, you can't control yourself. You can't please a woman. Even I know that. No wonder she's seeing somebody else. Boy, well, I got him all upset. <laughs> like a scene out of... Uh, an Al Pacino movie with Keanu Reeves, uh, <laughs> Devil's Advocate. <laughs> now you, now you got them all raging. You're like, you don't know what to do now, and I'm just getting started. I, I live for this stuff, <laughs> but I felt bad. And I ended it with this. I said, "Well, let me, let me ask you a question." He said, "What?" I said, "You a virologist?" He said, "A what?" My point said, exactly. Virologist. And he said, "I don't even know what that is." I said, "Then you should keep your mouth shut. You should, if you're going to be a dummy, be a quiet one." Right. I made a comment on, on Facebook. Someone wrote something about Amy Comey Barrett, and I said, fantastic. God bless you. Good job. And the woman said, you must be a, a white, liberal a-hole. And uh, Facebook didn't censor that. But my response, they censored and said, hey, we'll close your account if you use those terms again. I said, well, get that button ready. <laughs> get that button. You might as well send a clown with a hook like in the night of the I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm hitting it. Stuff. I'm hitting yeah. sin. I'm hitting <laughs> sin. <laughs> I mean, you don't know me. They don't have a common sense or, or their intelligence to look me up and see that I'm not what you say that I am just by appearances. But that's the world today, man. It's a tear down world. And we have to get into a place mm-hmm. where it's a build up world, like, just like what you're doing. Yeah. You think I didn't watch you training and working out and getting in? Do people know how hard that is? No. To get to a certain age as a man and to find the inner strength to pick up a weight. <laughs> Especially when it's not wartime and you're not a drug dealer. Think about that for a second. To actually say, I'm going to the gym today. I'm like, what's wrong with him? <laughs> what's wrong with me? I want to look better. I got all these tattoos. I don't want them to fade in one big blotch. You know, right. I want to look good. So people can't stand it when they see you do that because it's stuff that they won't do. Yeah, yeah. And that's not... You know, that's why I always do encouraging messages. That's why I always press thumbs up. That's why, hey, congratulations. That's the key, man, to see greatness in others and watch them recognize it in you, too, without tearing someone down. Yeah, and I, you know, a lot of the things that growing up in martial arts and, and like you and you mentioned some names earlier that most people will, who don't who are not martial artists, it'll fly right over their heads. Leave it that way. That's the way it's supposed to be. Right. Because it's a secret to yourself. Yeah. But I think that type of development in that beginning sets you up for service to humanity 100%. and self. And that is just how we're built. That is, that, is a, that is one of the better traits of a martial arts upbringing. The other side of it is I think that too many people have, have, have lived without this wonderful experience of being punched in the face really hard. Because Mike Tyson says everyone has a plan until you get punched in the nose, and that's the truth. And then when you combine that with social media, where you sit behind a computer, a thin sheet of glass, and you can talk all the garbage and you want to there's a knock at your door. And when that knock comes at that door, you turn on all the lights and sit there shivering, wondering, what did I say and who did I say it to? Mm -hmm. And so I think the beauty of actually being up front and being in the middle of of, of an act you learn the, the concept of retribution immediately. If I do this, this is what happens if I have done something wrong. Right. And if I do something good, this is what happens. So I always say something good is teaching a child how to defend itself. Something bad is slapping a woman around, right? Yeah. So I think that in between those two extremes is a place where we can find happiness. But until you have the experience of knowing that there is a, there is a, there is a reaction to what you just said or did, uh, that's the problem. And so, so many people like even uh, AOC out there talking about let's make a list of people who supported the president so we can have them fired from their jobs or destroyed in their personal... Yeah, I what saw that. What are you talking about? Yeah, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's a person who's never been... 
punch in the face. And I don't mean to go out and punch a, a AOC in the face. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying to you, because you know, life has a way of coming around and straightening you out one way or the other. And a lot of these people have just never been punched in the nose to know that, well, when you open your mouth and say things like that, or you do a thing like this, or you cause that problem, then you've got to pay for it. You just happen to be on an extended loan program with high interest. You don't know it yet, but you're going to find out when that bill comes to Yeah. And, and, you know, I just don't think they, they, you know, when someone says those things to me, it's the question of you must not cherish life. That's the question I have. Like, you, even if you say something about me, family, friends, and you, you, you're, 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 you, you know, you're charring off at the at the keyboard or the, the keyboard. text, you don't, you must not cherish life, because would you say those things when life is on the line? I'll give you a perfect example, man. Uh, seven years ago, I started getting these vicious emails. Vit, you sucked, your family sucked, your wife so horrible. All this. I'm like, what is this going? I said, well, who would be sending me this? Now, you got to remember the mind of a person who would do that. Right. Because the kind of person who would do that, you have to know. This is the funny thing about someone who attacks you personally. You have given them access to your life in some way. Because most people on the outside, if you're a, a, an average person, there's nobody stalking you, you know, unless you really make some bad decisions. You know, I told you not to drink, not to drink with him. He was just got out of jail. You go sitting there with a bottle of champagne and a cigarette, but think you're in heaven. Anyway, I start getting these emails. I'm going, man. It, it, the first thing on my mind is, well, I got to make sure it's not a real threat. Because I got a wife and kids. So I start writing back to the guy. But the reason I'm writing back to the guy is I want to know who he is. Because I knew it was a guy. Okay. Because the way he was writing to begin with, I knew it was a guy the way he was writing. Nope, no punctuations. So, no, it was punctuation, but, but his, <laughs> his, his comments and threats were really specific. So I knew he thought of himself as someone who was a tough guy. So I said, okay, that's the first thing. Okay. So it told me then he rides a motorcycle. I, knew, I don't know why I knew that, but I said, this guy rides a motorcycle. So it took me six months to find out who he was. So the, the, the minute I knew who he was, he was a guy who had submitted some work to AOF. Okay. He came one night to see a movie, and the the producer of the film, the director of the film, who happened to be a good friend of mine, didn't bring his movie and never turned it in. He thought we would just show it from the internet, which we couldn't do back mm-hmm. in 2015, 16. So I write the guy, because I figured him out. I, it, was, it was probably 98% for sure and 2% guess. So I, said, I, I wrote him back and I said, by his name, I called him by his name. I said, you write me one more letter. I'm going to drive the 87 miles to your house. <laughs> you and I are going to have a talk. And I'm going to explain to you exactly why you don't do things like you've been doing to people like me. This was his response. Wow, how'd you figure that out? Not denying it, because he's an idiot. Right. Right. His name. And uh, the complaint was that he'd ridden his motorcycle up to see the show and there was more movies, so he blamed the festival, but it wasn't the festival's fault. We took the blame on behalf of the director because he did not even bring his own film file. So I walked everybody across the street, brought them drinks, and did the whole dog and pony, and the director still jerked me around. As if, and I said, that's okay. I live with that. But what happened was this guy understood that I was coming. And I still get his name on the list. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to act on that because that would be violence. But I will tell you this. There's a very specific frequency from him to me now. Yes. It's like two RCA dogs dueling over the sound and not coming <laughs> from the phonograph. But uh, I'm telling you, he, he, he understands. And there won't be a point in my life where I won't remember this guy. He should, he, should, he should mark that down because you cannot get away with that type of act. You, don't, it's, you cannot put that kind of filth into the world and think it's going to come back clean. Right. You don't do it. So it, that's a part of the world, too. Social media has given us an opportunity to really uh, tear each other down from a distance. There's a film called Defiance. Um, it stars uh, Leah Schroeder and Daniel Craig. And it's the story of uh, uh, Jewish survivors fighting yes. off a yes. brigade. Yes. Um, well, the director, man, what a director. He made the film Glory with Denzel Washington. Right. And Morgan Freeman and Matthew Broderick. I love that film. So I had a chance to see the film with the director in Westwood when it came out. And this young lady had invited me, so we went together. 
we're sitting there, and as I'm watching the film, I'm getting viciously angry at this guy because the, uh, it it just it just stresses the credulity of belief in yeah. every direction, and you're and you are really it's, it's just it really is a, it's it's the worst propaganda film I've seen. It really is a propaganda film. So, but it was built on that. So and well. He went. He was so extra that he destroyed any opportunity. So I listen. I'm, I'm a fair guy. Then. So we listen to him talk, and he's about 15. Now I, I just want to walk up and say to him, "I have loved your work from the beginning, but I don't understand why you were creating something like this and then expect people to swallow it." But that's not my place. So I walk out and I get outside, and there's a few people milling around, and this woman says, "She's a Jewish woman," and she said, "You believe that garbage." And I said, what? She goes, that's a, I mean, that's some real garbage. And I said, well, tell me why you say that. And she expressed everything that I was thinking, but I wouldn't say. And so I said, well, thank you very much. And her husband came over. He was saying that some other people crowded her out. Well, the problem was I had respected him as a director. And it's the first time I ever wrote a negative review. And I went on, because I, I, I think people can, you if someone makes a movie, you don't know what they went through to make it. You don't know what they right. went to do. You have no idea. I see people crushing people's souls, not because the movie was good, bad, or different, but because they have the power to, to do so. Someone's soul. Yeah. And so they want to take that opportunity to show what an idiot they are. Yeah. So I looked at the review about six months later. I got so upset with myself, I took it down. And I started realizing that it wasn't a movie. It was a love letter to his people, mm -hmm. the Jewish people. He was trying to put them in a position as he saw them, right. not as we see them, but as he sees them. Mm -hmm. And it took a little perspective and understanding to finally get to that point. And I went, oh, that's what that was. I was under the impression I went to see a historical film about the Jews outwitting the Germans in World War II, which is what I wanted to see. And that's and instead, I was fed these giant spoonfuls of, 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 of uh, propaganda. But then I had to go back again and realize, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. That's only your perspective, sir. Wow. You didn't hear the stories from his his, his baba. Right. Or his grandfather, his babushka, or whatever you call it. You didn't hear those stories that he heard as a child for six, seven, eight uh, yeah. uh, uh, decades. And, the, and then the shared stories that's on his DNA from his grandfather and his grandmother and his great, great, great grandfather. You didn't, you don't experience that. So instead of just saying it wasn't for me. We become these vicious creatures tearing things down. And, and I wish we could just take a moment and say, well, hang on a second. Maybe that wasn't for me. See, Maybe it wasn't meant for me. But Dell, Dell, you, you're, 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 you're not... I'm not sure if it's credit or acknowledgement, but people have a hard time feeling their misunderstanding and, and think about their retrospect of how someone else could see it. That's, 100%. The, and, and, that, and you're right when it says we're in a world now that that is sensationalized on social media that there is no introspective or they don't think they have to be introspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it's a, we talked, I want to be honest, and my biggest post so far of 2020, we got the most likes, was a post that I did. And it was simply just a few words, and it said, I did not friend you because, unfriend you because of your opinion. I unfriended you because you're an asshole. <laughs> now, that thing got so many likes and, so, and comments and all. Now, but at the time, people were recognizing you're in this political arena. There's all kinds of things. And there's a lot of hate being spewed back and forth, right? Oh, God, that's good. That's fine. Okay. But don't put it on my page. Right. Because my page isn't about politics. My page is not about hatred. My page is not about social justice for people who've never had to be uh, 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 right. uh, validated as social justice to begin with. They, they, are the re they are the receivers of benefits, not the losers from benefits. Right. So when you yeah. say I'm a social justice warrior, what are you really? You are nothing. You are someone who's pining against your own experience, hoping to share the painful experience of someone else, and in that you can claim that you understand their plight. Well, we all know that's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's not all you're doing is usurping. Like I think that comedian on, on Saturday Night Live, Bill Bill Burr, he came out and said he watched white women co-op co black pain. 
And when he did it, the whole world came after him like the guy was telling the truth. <laughs> he was telling God's honest truth. You have not experienced. I don't know what a, a young Mexican mother feels walking 100 miles across Mexico to try and coyote her children across to America. I do the same thing. But I, I don't know how she feels. No, I don't know how she feels. So, I, to me, I mean, you you can't brush them with one big brush. And, and, I, and I find that people are making these, these statements. So, I think I dropped like 400 friends in three weeks or something. I was just delete, delete, delete. <laughs> I don't want that anymore. I like delete. Not, you know, I was hoping a guy sells some books last year. Great writer. We were at a, at a what's that book still the big one? Um, not you know, is it not Barnes and Noble? Barnes and Noble. Barnes okay, because yeah. I was thinking so of the, the other one. No, but we're at Barnes and Noble. We're selling books, and some guy walks in, and it's a religious book we were selling. So this guy walks in, and I said, "Hey, have you met Doctor Glenn?" Because that was my that's my approach. You know, if someone walks in the store, I'm a seller. I can sell anything. I've been selling stuff my whole life, and if I believe in it, watch out, because they're not really going to hit you on it. So this guy goes, oh, "I don't believe in God," and and the the good doctor turned his back on him and said, "Well, keep walking then." And I was like, wait a minute, that's a sale. Because I hear no, and I hear yes in my head. I don't understand what, that's like, that's like they're speaking gobbledygook. They go, no, what do you mean no? No, the answer is yes. And I, and I until I get that yes, I keep working. So I said, Doc, why did you turn your back on that man? You could have right. offered him God. You could have, he says, mm. even in the Bible, it says not to suffer fools. Mm. He says, why would you waste your time on one when you can impact a thousand? Yeah, yeah. And I went, oh, man. So when I got home, my Facebook, I tell you, my finger hurt for three days pressing that delete button <laughs> so fast so many times. <laughs> so when that post came up, people began liking it. And I'm going, that's really interesting that people respond to that anger. But it wasn't angry. I'm just no. saying, yeah. you really have to be an a-hole of epic proportion to not take a step back from yourself and say, yeah. what's going on? And the only thing that was going on with me was this. I don't want your hate in my existence. I can't stand your hate. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't taste good. I don't wear it well. No one likes it. So I, I can't be a part of it. And I think that people start recognizing you know, you hear all this negative stuff on the news. You know, you go to CNN and MSNBC, all it is is death and anger yeah. and murder. They're all look angry. At the, look yeah. at the crime rate. Look at COVID rates. Those COVID rates aren't, aren't real to begin with. No. They're just not. I happen to speak with a medical professional in uh, Los Angeles. He's been part of the medical society there uh, for about 45 years. And I walked into his place. I go, you're not wearing a mask. He goes, for what? <laughs> and he, he schooled me for like two hours. And I'm like... This guy deals with death every single day, every day. Hundreds of deaths per month. And he's walking around like there's nothing wrong. I said, what, aren't you afraid? He said, afraid of what? What's wrong with you? Are you slow? You know, that mask is about as, as powerful as a, as a stick and chewing gum. It changes nothing for anyone. It's a fear-based attack on your mentality and on your soul. And I just, I, it shook me. It just shook me that that I had gotten to a point that I didn't understand that I'm easily manipulable, manipulatable, love manipulable. I like that word. I'm easily manipulated, um, like everyone else, and and I don't want to be that way. So I'm I'm, I'm working my way out. You know, we get these information, and we don't know where we can get the we. It's a, the lack of a better word I'm going to use is the truth. Mm-hmm. And and so we we since we don't know what is the truth, we fall so easily into fear. Hundred percent. And 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 I don't think that's the opposite of truth. I really don't. I think if something is just something you may not believe, you do believe. It doesn't mean you have to literally go because I don't think non-truth is fear. It doesn't even seem like it's on the same line. But a lot of people do feel that way and. And, and that's, because they've been conditioned to feel that yeah. way. You know, there's a report out that this, the country of Canada had done this experiment with people in small towns by setting up uh, industrial speakers outside their towns and then putting wolf sounds out. And then sending letters, phony letters to people saying, hey, there's wolf attacks in your area. They just wanted to raise the paranoia and fear. It was a medical 
uh, in a, a military exercise. And it just happened in the last six months. And most people are like, I never heard of that. Well, let me ask you a question. Is it just because you didn't hear but it didn't happen or just because you're so stupid <laughs> and dense that it, because it's not in your, your purview, it right. should not exist? Right. And I think that's the difference we have to figure out with people that you actually have enemies working against you in your own government, in your own town, in your own club, and most likely in your own family. The question is, once you have that knowledge that they're out there, what do you do with that knowledge? Yeah, what, what, yeah, my thing. Yeah, what do you do with it? it under, not important, and move on with your life. That's all. Just file it and move on. Brother, I'm not going to keep you the rest of the night. You know, you're always welcome to come on the Black Coffee Conversation we're having this Saturday. I know you have the link. What time do the conversations start? It's 2 p.m. E- 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So it's 11 a.m. on Saturday. I will be there this Saturday. I've been traveling back and forth. I've been working with a lot of uh, amazing people in the last year. It's funny. Everyone has found a talent somehow. Everyone <laughs> thinks that... They know something somebody else doesn't know. And I realized if you had pulled your head out of your hole for two minutes, you'd recognize that people have been doing that for years. But everyone's, hey, I had an idea. (laughs) It took COVID, a presidential election, a social media upheaval to wake you up to make you think you had one idea. You better go back to sleep. Wait, I got an idea. <laughs> I got an idea. And then you want everybody to get behind your idea like it's the only idea. Me, you mean they want money from it? Well, Cause, I've never in my life heard so many people say to me, because I do a deal where I'll do a half an hour consultation with anybody. They got an idea for a movie or a script or whatever. Just If you want to flesh it out, if you want to talk to somebody about it before you, just give me a call. Half an hour, I'll give you half an hour free. I always do that. And this guy called me up, and I, I talked for a while, and I realized it's going to cost me A, B, C, D, E, F, and G to be involved in this project. And I said to myself, what's it going to cost him? And the answer was nothing. Right, right. And I realized that's a mistake. Yeah. If I have to, for your idea, it's going to cost me all this. I mean, I'd rather just write a check. Because there's no way I can give you all this attention. No. And, it, and, and you have no sweat, no skin in the game. It, it, it's offensive, but that, they're out there. And sometimes you got to just you know pull that plug and say, thank you very much, but it's just not for me, and God bless you. Hallelujah. You know, Brother Dell. Pray the Shema and move on. <laughs> Brother Dell, you kiss the, kiss the family and everyone for me, please. And we'll be in touch. I'll talk to you later. Everyone, please contact Dell if you have an idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, if you're sincere and you're serious, yeah. uh, I just did a deal with Kenya Cagle from the New York school system before they shut him down. Okay. Uh, minority kids want to make a film, and I made an offer to them. I did a, a talk with them. I said, hey, kids, if anyone needs to you can call me, the best way to get me is I've never self promoted before in a really real way, but I just launched my site, dellweston.com. Mm-hmm. Dell, D E L W E S T O N, dellweston.com. If you're making a movie or a script, you're writing a book, and you need help, just give me a call. I don't mind consulting for half an hour, but past that, you know, it's got to be a free flow of exchange, money, trust, belief, and then, right. of course, hope for success. And if it's anything short of that, just watch some more cable. Leave me out here. <laughs> off your, off your two things to do list, please. Yeah, there's, there's more important things to do. We have we will make a choice to live, right? And, and living... Brother, you are the fastest hour in podcasting. You think so? That was beautiful. Even my shows get boring to me after a while. You, this is fantastic. Thank you. I, I, Thank that, you. that, that's, I, that's, a, that's a lot coming from you. Please. Well, I hope you'll send me a link so I can promote this properly. I will. I, I will just want to offer you one thing before we go. We are doing our huge year in special action on film, all action edition, and I'd like you to write your first article for the magazine, um, if you'd like to. Uh, to do something like that with us, uh, I would love to have you uh, in some way represented in that in that dish. Yep, I will. I think it would be powerful. I will have an article to you by Monday. Include your photos, please. I will. And uh, we'll have some fun, as we always do. Thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for doing such a beautiful show, and thank yeah. you for putting your voice out there yeah, for you. people who don't understand that there are people who do have answers because they found a certain right. light themselves. And I love that you said that you do therapy as well and that you receive therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have operator's manuals for our brains usually. 
No. And people like you uh, give us a hint the direction it goes. So thank you for that. God bless, man. God bless. God bless. Mm-hmm.